Hi, Grandma here, reading The Call of the Wild by Jack London. <clears throat> and I'm going to begin Chapter 7, but I will not end Chapter 7. It's a very long chapter, <clears throat> and it's called The Sounding of the Call. It is also the last chapter. <clears throat> if you remember in Chapter 6, um, John Thornton got caught up in a bet, uh, a wager, that uh, Buck could break a sled with a thousand pounds loose um, from the ice and then drag it for, I think, a hundred yards. Uh, and uh, all the men in the, in the area were betting on it. And, <clears throat> and John Thornton uh, made $1,600, $1,600 uh, based on Buck achieving that goal. When Buck earned $1,600 in five minutes from John Thornton, he made it possible for his master to pay off certain debts and to journey with his partners into the East after a fabled lost mine, the history of which was as old as the history of the country. Many men had sought it, few had found it, and more than a few there were who had never returned from the quest. This lost mine was steeped in tragedy and shrouded in mystery. No one knew of the first man. The oldest tradition stopped before it got back to him. From the beginning, there had been an ancient and ramshackle cabin. Dying men had sworn to it and to the mine in the site of which it marked, clinching their testimony with nuggets that were unlike any known grain of gold in the Northland. But no living man had looted this treasure house, and the dead were dead. Wherefore, John Thornton and Pete and Hans, with Buck and half a dozen other dogs, faced into the east on an unknown trail to achieve where men and dogs, as good as themselves, had failed. They sledded 70 miles up the Yukon, swung to the left into the Stewart River, passed the Mayo and the McQuestion, and held on until the Stuart itself became a streamlet, threading the upstanding peaks which marked the backbone of the continent. John Thornton asked little of man or nature. He was unafraid of the wild. With a handful of salt and a rifle, he could plunge into the wilderness and fare wherever he pleased, and as long as he pleased. Being in no haste, Indian fashion, he hunted his dinner in the course of a day's travel, and if he failed to find it, like the Indians, he kept on traveling, secure in the knowledge that sooner or later he would come to it. So on this great journey into the east, straight meat was the bill of fare. Ammunition and tools principally made up the load on the sled, and the time card was drawn upon the limitless future. To Buck, it was boundless delight, this hunting, fishing, and indefinite wandering through strange places. For weeks at a time, they would hold on steadily, day after day, and for weeks upon end, they would camp here and there, the dogs loafing, the men burning holes through forest muck and gravel and washing countless pans of dirt by the heat of the fire. Sometimes they went hungry. Sometimes they feasted ridiculously, riotously, all according to the abundance of game and the fortune of hunting. Summer arrived and the dogs and men packed on their backs, rafted across blue mountain lakes and descended or ascended unknown rivers in slender boats whipsawed from the standing forest. <clears throat> I'm going to pause here. And that was a vocabulary word I didn't know. And so I found this picture on Google of two men whipsawing lumber in the Yukon in the late 1800s. And I thought it was appropriate since that's basically what we're talking about. You'll see one man is standing up and he has one end of the saw. And it's a very long saw. And beneath the wood is another man crouched and he has the other end of it. So in order to make lumber, they simply saw through this wood and then they move the wood and saw some more. But that's what they're doing is they're making lumber. Okay. 
The months came and went, and back and forth they twisted through the uncharted vastness where no men were, and yet where men had been, if the lost cabin were true. They went across divides in summer blizzards, shivered under the midnight sun on naked mountains between the timberline and the eternal snows, dropped into summer valleys amid swarming gnats and flies, and in the shadows of glaciers picked strawberries and flowers as ripe and fair as any in the Southland would boast. And remember, the Southland is California or any place in the uh, <clears throat> contiguous United States, I think. In the fall of the year, they penetrated a weird lake country, sad and silent, where wildfowl had been, but where there then there was no life, nor sign of life, only the blowing of chill winds, the forming of ice in sheltered places, and the melancholy rippling of waves on lonely beaches. And through another winter, they wandered on the obliterated trails of men who had gone before. Once they came upon a path blazed through the forest, an ancient path, and the lost cabin seemed very near. But the path began nowhere and ended nowhere, and it remained mystery as the man who made it, and the reason he made it remained mystery. Another time they chanced upon the time-graven wreckage of a hunting lodge, and amid the shreds of rotted blankets, John Thornton found a long-barreled flintlock which is a, a gun, a rifle, the shotgun. He knew it for a Hudson Bay Company gun of the young days in the Northwest, when such a gun was worth its height in beaver skins packed flat. And that was all. No hint as to the man who an earlier day had reared the lodge and left the gun among the blankets. Spring came on once more, and at the end of all their wandering, they found not the lost cabin, but a shallow placer in a broad valley where the gold showed like yellow butter across the butter at the bottom of the washing pans. They sought no farther. Each day they worked, earned them thousands of dollars in clean dust and nuggets, and they worked every day. The gold was sacked in moose hide bags, 50 pounds to the bag and piled like so much firewood outside the spruce bough lodge. Like giants they toiled, days flashing on the heels of days, like dreams as they heaped the treasure up. There was nothing for the dogs to do, save the hauling in of meat now and again that Thornton killed, and Buck spent long hours musing by the fire. So... The vision of the short-legged hairy man came to him more frequently, now that there was little work to be done. And often, blinking by the fire, Buck wandered with him in that other world which he remembered. Now, back in chapter three, he also had these visions of an ape-like man, which I would assume is like a caveman, who first domesticated uh, dogs. And that is what Buck is remembering back to, uh, his ancestors um, being uh, domesticated by this caveman. The salient thing of this other world seemed fear. When he watched the hairy man sleeping by the fire, head between his knees and hands clasped above, Buck saw that he slept restlessly with many starts and awakenings at which time he would peer fearfully into the darkness and fling more wood upon the fire. Do they walk by the back beach of a sea where the hairy man gathered shellfish and ate them as he gathered? It was with eyes that roved everywhere for hidden danger and with legs prepared to run like the wind at its first appearance. Through the forest they crept noiselessly, buck at the hairy man's heels, and they were alert and vigilant the pair of them, ears twitching and moving and nostrils quivering, for the man heard and smelled as keenly as Buck. The hairy man could spring up into the trees and travel ahead as fast as on the ground, swinging by the arms from limb to limb, sometimes dozens of feet apart, letting go and catching, never falling, never missing his grip. In fact, he seemed as much at home among the trees as on the ground 
and Buck had memories of nights of vigil spent beneath trees wherein the hairy man roosted, holding on tightly as he slept. And closely akin to the visions of the hairy man was the call, still sounding in the depths of the forest. It filled him with a great unrest and strange desires. It caused him to feel a vague, sweet gladness, and he was aware of wild yearnings and stirrings for he knew not what. Sometimes he pursued the call into the forest, looking for it as though it were a tangible thing, barking softly or defiantly as the mood might dictate. He would thrust his nose into the cool wood moss or into the black soil where long grasses grew and snort with joy at fat earth smells. Or he would crouch for hours as if in concealment behind fungus-covered trunks of fallen trees, wide-eyed, wide-eared to all that moved and sounded about him. It might be lying thus that he hoped to surprise this call he could not understand. But he did not know why he did these various things. He was impelled to do them and did not reason about them at all. Irresistible impulses seized him. He would be lying in camp, dozing lazily in the heat of the day, when suddenly his head would lift and his ears cock up, intent in listening, and he would spring to his feet and dash away, and on and on for hours through the forest aisles, across the open spaces where the nigger heads bunched. Now I'm going to pause here because this is a, a vocabulary word that I was totally unfamiliar with and a little shocked by, but I, you have to remember that this was written a hundred years ago when things were different. So I thought, well, what would we call it today? Well, I looked it up and it really has no other name. It's a, it's more of a phenomenon than a, than a uh, particular kind of grass. But here is the grass and you can see how it does look like heads of people all bowed in a field, but it is caused by the freezing of the dirt and the grass remains brown and, and in some cases it was even green on top, but underneath it is uh, frozen solid. But meanwhile, around these tufts, the, 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 the roots have lifted them. So there's like uh, pathways which is why it creates these head-like looking graph structures. Anyway, moving on now. He loved to run down dry water courses and to creep and spy upon the bird life in the woods. For a day at a time, he would lie in the underbrush where he could watch the partridges drumming and strutting up and down. But especially he loved to run in the dim twilight of the summer midnights listening to the subdued and sleepy murmurs of the forest, reading signs and sounds as man may read a book and seeking for the mysterious something that called, called waking or sleeping at all times for him to come. Now, they talk here about the summer midnights and um, we have been to Alaska and we have been to the Yukon <clears throat> and we went in June, which is when it's the uh, longest days, and uh, it never really gets nighttime. Uh, the sun isn't always up and shining. It's kind of like early in the morning or, or right before sunset when the sun has gone down, but it's still light out. Well, it's like that for the whole night, and that's what he's talking about. Uh, those are the times when he really feels the call. One night he sprang from sleep with a start, eager-eyed, nostrils quivering and scenting. His mane bristling in recurrent waves. From the forest came the call, or one note of it, for the call has many notes. Distinct and definite as never before, a long drawn out howl, like yet unlike any noise made by a husky dog. And he knew it in the old familiar way as a sound heard before. He sprang through the sleeping camp and in swift silence dashed through the woods. As he drew closer to the cry, he went more slowly with caution 
in every moment, till he came to an open place among the trees and look it out, saw erect on haunches with nose pointed to the sky, a long lane timber wolf. He had made no noise, yet it ceased from its howling and tried to sense his presence. Buck stalked into the open, half crouching, body gathered compactly together, tail straight and stiff and feet falling with unwanted care. Every movement, every movement advertised commingled threatening and overture of friendliness. So there's a friendliness, but there's also a threat here. It was the menacing truth that mark, truce that marks the meeting of wild beasts that prey. That's P-R-E-Y. But the wolf fled at the sight of him. He followed with wild leapings in a frenzy to overtake. He ran him into a blind channel in the bed of the creek where a timber jam barred the way. The wolf whirled around, pivoting on its hind legs after the fashion of Joe and of all the cornered husky dogs, snarling and bristling, clicking his teeth together in a continuous and rapid succession of snaps. Buck did not attack, but circled him about and hedged him in with friendly advances. The wolf was suspicious and afraid, for Buck made three of him in wait, while his head barely reached Buck's shoulder. Watching his chance, he darted away and the chase was resumed. Time and again, he was cornered and the thing repeated, though he was in poor condition or Buck would not so easily have overtaken him. He would run till Buck's head was even with his flank. And when he would whirl around at bay only to dash away again at the first opportunity. But in the end, Buck's per pertinacity was rewarded for the wolf finding that no harm was intended, finally sniffed noses with him. Then they became friendly and played about in the nervous, half-coy way with which fierce beasts belie their fierceness. After some time of this, the wolf started off at an easy lope in a manner that plainly showed he was going somewhere. He made it clear to Buck that he was to come, and they ran side by side through the somber twilight straight up the creek bed into the gorge from which it issued and across the bleak divide where it took its rise. On the opposite slope of the watershed, they came down into a level country where were great stretches of forest and many streams. And through these great stretches, they ran steadily hour after hour, the sun rising higher and the day growing warmer. Buck was wildly glad. He knew he was at last answering the call, running by the side of his wood brother toward the place from whence the call surely came. Old memories were coming upon him fast, and he was stirring to them as of old. He stirred to the realities of which they were the shadows. He had done this thing before, somewhere in that other and dimly remembered world, and he was doing it again, now, running free in the open, the unpacked earth underfoot, the wide sky overhead. They stopped by a running stream to drink, and stopping, Buck remembered John Thornton. He sat down. The wolf started on toward the place from which the call surely came, then returned to him, sniffing noses and making actions as though to encourage him. But Buck turned about and started slowly on the back track. For the better part of an hour, the wild brother ran by his side, whining softly. Then he sat down, pointed his nose upward and howled. It was a mournful howl. And as Buck held steadily on his way, he heard it grow faint and fainter until it was lost in the distance. Well, there was not much action in this, but we got a lot of information about what's going on in Buck's head. He is reverting to the wild, and he knows that out there somewhere is where he's supposed to be. Um, and the wolf recognizes that uh, Buck is not just an ordinary dog, um, but is a peer 
in many ways. Um, but Buck remembers John Thornton and he adores John Thornton. And so now he's torn between finding his life, what he has life, what he has been looking for, and uh, staying with John Thornton. Okay, bye-bye.